So these creatures engage in dominance disputes, and I think dominance is the right way to think about it, because lobsters aren't very empathic and they're not very social, and so it really is the toughest lobster that wins. You know, and what's so cool about the lobster is that when a lobster wins, he flexes and gets bigger, so he looks bigger, because he's a winner. It's like he's advertising that, and the neurochemical system that makes him flex is serotonergic. And you think, well, who cares? What the hell does that mean? Well, tell you what it means. It's the same chemical that's affected by antidepressants in human beings. And so, like, if you're depressed, you're a defeated lobster. Like, you're, you're like this. I'm small. I'm not, you know, things are dangerous. I don't want to fight. You give someone an antidepressant, it's like up. They stretch, and then they're ready to, like, take on the world again. Well, if you give lobsters who just got defeated in a fight serotonin, then they stretch out and they'll fight again. And that's, like, we separated from those creatures on the evolutionary time scale somewhere between 350 and 600 million years ago, and the damn neurochemistry is the same. And so that's another indication of just how important hierarchies of authority are. Jordan Peterson has made quite the name for himself on the internet. In his book, 12 Rules for Life, he says that lobsters demonstrate hierarchy in their society. He says that since lobsters have social hierarchies, therefore, hierarchies are natural, Therefore, since hierarchies are natural, they must also be good. He received some backlash for his statements, and he has continued to double down on these claims. I know my neurochemistry. So if you're going to play neurochemistry, let's go and do it. Okay, well you say antidepressants work on lobsters. Yes, they do. So today, I follow in the footsteps of my ancestors. Like so many bread tubers before me, I'm going to examine Jordan Peterson's lobster claims. Strap in. Jordan Peterson says that lobsters use a neurotransmitter, serotonin, in their brains just like humans do. And yeah, this is true that lobsters and humans use serotonin. Do you know who else that's true for? The vast majority of animal species. Animal species, from bonobos to worms, use serotonin. It's such a common chemical in nature that even trees, vegetables, mushrooms, fruits, they all produce serotonin. But you might be wondering if there are other similarities between the human brain and lobster brain. Well, it is true that lobsters were used to test a certain type of antidepressants, referred to as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. However, lobsters react differently than humans to serotonin. When serotonin levels increase in lobsters, they become more aggressive, while humans become less aggressive. In the antidepressant study that Peterson is referencing here, well, yeah, only one antidepressant drug was developed using lobsters as test subjects. And again, lobsters do not respond to SSRIs the same way humans do. So the study didn't start with a bunch of depressed lobsters and then end with recovered crustaceans. Instead of lobsters, most antidepressant studies include mice. Mice are much, much more common subjects for SSRI studies. This next section is going to deal with some minor lab mistreatment of animals, so some viewers may want to look away for the next section and jump to the time shown here. Using mice to test SSRIs is so common that there are a variety of methods that scientists use to measure the effectiveness of these medications. These tests include the forced swim test and tail suspension tests, where rodents are forced into uncomfortable situations and the scientists measure how long they try to escape. The mice consume SSRIs, and the ones who fight the longest are considered to have consumed the most efficient SSRI. Other examples of tests include sucrose preference, intracranial self-stimulation, novelty-induced hypophagia, open field tests, elevated plus maze, and the dark light box. All these tests are very rodent-specific. For example, rodents have high anxiety in relation to brightly lit large spaces. So, for the dark light box test and open field test, the rodent is put in an environment where they are exposed to bright lights and open spaces, which introduce anxiety. All these tests are specific to rodents and antidepressant tests and could not apply to lobsters. Rodents are the main test subjects for SSRIs, not lobsters. Once again, lobsters were only used in the development of only one antidepressant. And do I need to again emphasize how common serotonin is in nature? Antidepressants have been used for treatments on dogs, tigers, gorillas, chimps, zebras, cats, and pandas. These treatments work because serotonin is such a common transmitter that SSRIs tend to work across animal species pretty easily. Remember, they are even found in trees, 
walnuts, mushrooms, vegetables, fruits. As a side note, don't throw antidepressants at your dog if he seems down. As with most medications, dosage is important and your dog may need a significantly smaller dose than you do. Furthermore, it's strange that Peterson wants to build our society based on the precedent set by animal hierarchies. The reason I point this out is because there are female hierarchies in nature. Dolphins, whales, elephants, bees, ants, lemurs, meerkats, mole rats, hyenas, killer whales, these are all female-led societies. Now maybe you want to think of patriarchal animal societies. Let's take a look at lions for instance. Lions are one of the traditional symbols of masculinity and patriarchy. One problem though, lions also live in a matriarchal society. Male lions are essentially bodyguards for the pride. And I don't expect you to believe me, but let's go ahead and listen to this quote. Females are the core, the heart and soul of the pride. The males come and go. That quote is from Dr. Craig Packer, director of the Lion Center at the University of Minnesota in an interview with National Geographic. He is considered one of the leading experts of lions and has even researched alongside Dr. Jane Goodall in Africa. Dr. Packer explains that male lions are essentially bodyguards that only temporarily live in prides. There are multiple sources to back up this information. When researching this video, I was really surprised to learn that this is common knowledge among biologists. If we want to move closer to humans on the evolutionary tree, we can look at chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimps and bonobos are considered the closest living ancestors to humans. It is true that chimpanzees live in patriarchal societies. In contrast, bonobos are matriarchal in nature. But why do I even need to point this out? Nature equals good is a logical fallacy. If you take any sort of debate class or philosophy class, this is day one stuff. There's even a name for this type of logical fallacy. It's called appeal to nature. As the way the humans are, I think you're anthropomorphizing into a ridiculous degree. These are I creatures that, that urinate out of their faces. I think that uh, the fundamental issue among um, knowledgeable uh, animal behaviorists is that anthropomorphization with animals is generally the appropriate tactic unless you have reason to doubt it. While I'm fine with shampoo brands calling themselves all natural, Basing our views of society and gender on this fallacy is ridiculous. If we were to follow this fallacy, we would find ourselves in some pretty ugly places. Also, over 1,500 animal species practice cannibalism. In aquatic systems, like the ones lobsters live in, 90% of organisms are cannibals. That's right, scientists have discovered that due to climate change, lobsters are now a cannibalistic species. So maybe don't go all natural on me, honey. Jordan Peterson has a doctorate in psychology, not biology or psychiatry. I need to point this out because he does not necessarily have the expertise required to make these leaps in logic. Do you know who is qualified to speak about neurotransmitters? Dr. Robert Sapolsky. Dr. Sapolsky graduated from Harvard with a degree in biological anthropology a field of science which examines the biological differences between humans and their ancestors. Later, he graduated from Rockefeller University with a degree in neuroendocrinology, which is the study of the nervous system and hormones. His expertise does include neurotransmitters such as serotonin. He has been conducting research in Kenya since the late 70s. What has he been studying in Kenya? Baboons, stress, depression, and neurotransmitters such as serotonin. While both Peterson and Sapolsky are professors who have gained media attention, Sapolsky is a much more qualified authority on the subject of neurotransmitters. Furthermore, the research he provides is much more substantial than Peterson's lobster argument. It's so weird that Peterson keeps using this lobster thing as an example. It's almost as if there's some type of monetary incentive for him or something. On an unrelated note, look at all this cool, overpriced lobster merch that Peterson is selling on his website. Back to the original clip, you may have noticed that Peterson had used his lobster argument to nestle some conclusions. He believes hierarchies are generally good, and on another day, I can debunk that claim. But I want to look at one specific hierarchy he is interested in perpetuating. He wants to use this belief of hierarchies and dominance to justify the belief that men should be dominant in society. Almost all the people who are hyper um, 
what would you call, hyper-focused on things, they're almost all men. And all the people who are hyper-focused on people are almost all women. It also doesn't have anything to do with intelligence, but it does have to do with interest, and the differences in interest are big. Unfortunately, many of the people who are talking about things like gender differences, they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know the literature. They don't know there is a literature. They don't understand biology, like the, the social constructionist types, the women's studies types, the neo-Marxists. They don't give a damn about biology. A study done a while ago, and unfortunately I don't remember the author, but they were looking at junior high math prodigies. And they're, they're pretty equally distributed between boys and girls. But by the time university came along, the math prodigy boys, they tend to go into the STEM fields, but the girls wouldn't. And it isn't because they lacked ability, because they had stellar ability. It's because they weren't interested. Basically, he believes that nature, not nurture, is the force at work here. You know who disagrees with him? Dr. Sapolsky. Sapolsky disproves the very study that Peterson was using. So they were looking at math skills. Yes, junior high school kids who were taking the math part of the SATs. That's part of being getting into this Hopkins program. So they took the math SATs and they looked at those 40,000 scores and saw that there was a gender difference in the average score on the math SATs with boys scoring higher. And the Reader's Digest covered this and used the phrase, the math gene, and discussing how this was the definitive study showing that more boys have the math gene. Like, you already know that's like nonsense on so many different levels. And what, of course, completely rips apart that study, and it was shameful that thing was ever published, let alone got as much attention as it did, is the fact that the environment was not exactly the same. Endless number of studies have shown beginning by first grade, if it is a simple math problem at that stage for the same hands put up, a boy is more likely to be called on than a girl. Studies showing that for the same correct answer, boys in elementary schools are more likely to be praised for the correct answer than are girls. By the, high, by the time junior high school is coming around, guidance counselors are already differentially by sex advising once you get into high school to take more elective math. Tremendous, massive differences in environment. And this study, using this whole argument of if there's an identical var environment and you see differences, it's due to genes. And predicated on that, if that's not true an hour after life, it was ludicrous that they were making this argument about 13-year-olds. The really fun thing about this situation is that Sapolsky's lecture came out four years before Peterson's crap. Sapolsky accidentally debunked future Peterson by actually paying attention to facts and logic. I love using a real intellectual like Sapolsky as a counter to pseudo-intellectuals like Peterson. Finally, Peterson wants to perpetuate the myth that men like to lead and are genetically programmed to be leaders. While our world is mostly dominated by men, this hasn't always been so. Human societies were originally egalitarian. When we were hunter-gatherers, we had more or less gender equality. Humans eventually settled and became farmers and created agricultural societies. Some of these civilizations became patriarchal and some remained egalitarian. Others even became matriarchal. Ancient Egypt was egalitarian, as were some of the cultures that became ancient Greece. Eventually, Athens became predominantly patriarchal, but Sparta maintained its gender equality. Even Celtic societies had equal rights for men and women. In ancient Britain, Queen Boudicca was a Celtic chieftain. The invading Roman army considered her powerless because she was a woman. However, she raised a massive army to fight the Roman soldiers, to the point of nearly costing the Roman Empire the British Isles. A statue of her still stands in London to this day. And while I could point to modern matriarchal societies, I don't think we need to look at anecdotal evidence. There are scientific papers, which I will link below, that show that gender equality is, in general, innate to human beings. While humans seem to instinctively lean into gender egalitarianism, culture also plays a role. We measure ourselves based on societal expectations. We live in a society. If we grow up in a culture that emphasizes patriarchy and the atomic family, we're satisfied when we get married and have two kids. The reverse is also true. In feminist societies, couples are happier when there's an equal division of labor. But I want to emphasize satisfied versus happy. 
In patriarchal societies, where the atomic family is idealized, people feel as though it's their duty to fulfill this structure. So when a trad couple gets married and has two kids, they are satisfied because they fulfilled their duty. On the other hand, egalitarianism seems to lead to an actual increase in happiness as well as satisfaction. This is because people aren't doing something they perceive as a chore. This is something they have decided they want for themselves. To simplify, in a patriarchal society, during your family's Christmas party, your mother constantly nags you to get married and give her some grandbabies, and your cousin says you're not getting any younger. First is an egalitarian society, when your Christmas party is instead filled with conversations congratulating you on your new promotion or asking you to go on a trip to the beach next summer. It's clear that in the first scenario, some people feel relief when they get married because they just want to be left alone, while in the egalitarian society, you get married because that's the right choice for you at that time. I know this discussion is very nuanced and complicated, but essentially, egalitarianism seems to be better overall for everyone. Take this study for example. The researchers discovered that men who had traditional marriages and traditional gender roles were actually more dissatisfied in their marriage than men in egalitarian marriages. These two studies here discuss how fathers in egalitarian societies enjoy fatherhood more than fathers in patriarchal societies. In addition, heterosexual relationships where men and women equally control finances tend to have more satisfying and more stable relationships opposed to relationships where only men control the finances. Once again, I know this discussion is very nuanced and complicated, but egalitarianism creates a better society overall for everyone. Peterson is overly simplifying gender relationships and gender identity. Let's keep in mind, this whole time Peterson and I have been discussing binary cisgender people. We could have a much much longer video discussing everything Peterson doesn't know about gender identity, but to be quite frank, I don't feel as though I'm well enough researched on that topic yet in order to discuss gender identity. In addition, many people in Peterson's audience aren't ready for that discussion yet, so I'll go ahead and table that discussion for another day. Gender relationships have been complicated throughout human history, but studies have shown that gender equality leads to better outcomes for everyone. Thank you so much for watching. This video took a lot of research, so please give me a thumbs up because apparently it's good for the algorithm. I would like to give a shout out to one of my most recent subscribers. Sure, why not? Guess so. Comment below who you think would be the most aggressive lobster, Jordan Peterson or Robert Sapolsky. My big problem with the lobsters is that it's scientifically bollocks.